Hello everyone, this is Professor Hosselman, History uh, 101 Online, and instead of today's uh, live conference today, um, I'm just going to record our lecture um, uh, that I would normally have given during the live conference. I apologize for those that are wanting to tune in live. Uh, if you have any questions about, uh, about the lecture, you can uh, post any comments online, and I'm glad to answer those. So today we're going to be talking about colonial societies, um, and the early societies that of mostly Europeans that came over here. Now, prior to watching this video, uh, you did watch a video on uh, the Reformation in Europe, as because one of the guiding principles behind uh, the the motion of Europeans from Europe out into the world was was very religiously motivated. So be sure to watch that uh, prior to watching this, um, so you can get some idea of the religious fervor in Europe and the split between Catholicism and Protestantism. Now, in to, in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the Spanish the French, the Dutch, and the English in the Americas. And we're going to be looking about how each of these groups differentiated from one another and how they managed to form uh, certain colonies and expand their uh, their territories in the, the discovery of the New World. Now we know from watching the last uh, video that the first uh, Europeans to arrive were the Spanish with Columbus and then a huge wave followed afterwards as discovery, uh, as the age of discovery unfolded. So let's talk first about the Spanish. Now, because of the vast wealth uh, it generated, Spanish monarchs tried to keep their American colonies under tight control. Now, colonies organized into what were called vice royalties under a vice royal directly appointed by the king. So that's the government of Spanish America. So when we compare, as we as we move forward, we'll we'll find some comparisons between the way the different colonies uh, were run. Now, the Catholic Church was very strong in the New World. Bartolome, Bartolome de las Casas, who he mentioned last time, successfully promoted the idea that the Indians had souls and should not be killed or enslaved. Missions had the dual purpose of converting the Indians to Christianity and civilizing them, uh, that is, turning them into good Spanish peasants. So, the government uh, control as well as the control in the Catholic Church. Now, under the control of, of Spain, and, the, and not, the, not, not as much a church, but under the control of Spain, the system of labor that developed in the New World under the Spanish colonies was known as the encomienda, which was a, a grant of land and urban laborers to a Spaniard. So if a Spaniard wanted to come over and, or was given land, a vice royalty in the New World, all the Native Americans on that would, were now granted to the Spaniard, and he was supposed to um, uh, protect them. Now, the Spaniard could make use of the Indian labor, but in return was expected to work to convert the Indians to Christianity and civilize them. Now, although that was the, uh, the theory behind it, in practice, early encomiendas involved the ruthless, ruthless exploitation of natives. And this was the system that was set up uh, under uh, Spain in the colonies. Now the other nation that, uh, the other European nation that founded colonies was the French. Now the French moved gradually into North America in the 16th century. Like the Spanish, they initially came looking for treasure, but found none in what is today uh, Quebec. They stayed, however, because they found it profitable to trade European goods with the Indians for animal furs. So whereas the Spanish were looking for gold and silver and precious metals and found a lot of it in the New World, the French in turn looked for furs, something that was actually on the rise in Europe at this time because the lack of precious metals um, was not worth it to the French, so they in, in, in turn focused on the fur trade. Like the Spanish, they tried to convert the Indians to Christianity, but initially did not seek conquest. The fur trade uh, worked best with a limited French pr uh, presence who were mostly traders. So if you want to have good relations with the natives, send less people for one, and two, less people me means more profit for the nation. And a lot of the things that we did, that the French did, was set up good trading relationships with the Indians. Eventually, the French established larger settlements, um, but were small compared to the English. So we have the Spanish arriving, the French arriving, and now we're going to talk really briefly about um, the Dutch. So Holland, by the 17th century, was a leading commercial power in Europe, making it a rival to England. 
Now, in the process of gaining independence from Spain, it developed global colonial trade interests, including those in America. Now, the Dutch established a colony in the Hudson River Valley, uh, trading for furs with Indians at Fort Orange, or present-day Albany. Now, Holland's small population and prosperity meant few immigrants came to America, making the colony vulnerable. Now, the colony, especially its commercial capital of New Amsterdam, which later gets renamed uh, New York City, also attracted a, div a diverse population with little loyalty to Holland. So we're, although there were a large number of Dutch, there were also other groups of people, and they outnumbered the Dutch, and very little of them actually had uh, close ties with, uh, with, with Holland. Hence, there was little resistance when the English invaded the colony in 1664, renaming it New York after its new ruler, uh, the Duke of York, later to become James II. So we have the arrival of the Spanish, the French, and the Dutch. Now we're going to change gears and we're going to talk specifically about English colonization. Now, the first successful English colony in North America was established at Jamestown in Virginia in 1607. Established by the Virginia Company of London, a joint stock company chartered by James I. Now, the intent of the colony, of the company, excuse me, was to emulate the Spanish model. Uh, live initially by exploiting the Indians, find and seize Indian treasure, and this model did not work because the Indians in the Chesapeake region were poor hunter farmers. They weren't like the, the large Inca and Aztec empires that the Spaniards uh, encountered uh, and the Portuguese encountered in um, South America. Now, most early colonists soon died from disease and starvation as well. And just to go back real quick, a joint stock company is a company in which investors uh, and invest funds uh, to lessen the risk of a voyage. So instead of one person spending all the money, it might be a hundred men splitting the cost. And so if the, uh, the, the company fails, they all have limited liability, meaning they, they, they don't lose everything, they may only lose a small percentage. Now the salvation of the colony was tobacco brought in from the Caribbean. After the introduction of tobacco, Virginia prospered, although life remained rough and life spans short into the late 1600s. So Virginia was a colony founded on tobacco, or a, a, a colony founded upon smoke, as John Rolfe would later say. Now, life in the early Chesapeake, in this region of Chesapeake, is what we often, would often call the middle colonies as well. The Chesapeake region is right along the coast, which is including Virginia and the Carolinas, um, was brutish and short and had a very light, low life expectancy. About 40% were dead within six years of arrival, and two-thirds were dead within 10 years. There was also an imbalanced sex ratio. Men outnumbered women. Uh, the, the population was very scattered and had a very low density, meaning it was spread out throughout the colonies and not centered around one major city like New Amsterdam or New York, as an example. The living conditions were very primitive, um, but there were some positives. There was more food in, the, in the, uh, the New World and a chance to own your own land, which many of the colonists did not have the opportunity back in England, where land was still owned and um, and controlled by the elite, a very small percentage of the population. Now, unlike Virginia, as we move into another set of colonies, the New England colonies, they had religious motivations for coming to America. So the Chesapeake and Virginia were economic, uh, company-based motivations. The New England colonies were more religiously based. The English monarchy was increasingly hostile during the reign of Charles I to people who refused to follow the hierarchy of the church in England, and as in these would those who were, who were Anglicans. So if you were Puritan, if you were Catholic, if you were any other faith besides Ang Anglican, um, those who refused were often treated very badly and persecuted under the reign of Charles I. Now, Plymouth was established by a separatist Puritans in 1620 near Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Uh, these were the famous pilgrims, and after a difficult start, their colony what became a success. Now, shortly after the arrival of the pilgrims in Plymouth, 
a new group of uh, Puritans, known as Congressionalist Puritans, established the much larger colony of Massachusetts Bay in 1629. Uh, they saw this uh, as an errand into the wilderness, so an errand to the wilderness, and many of the leaders at the time saw this as a way for them to escape their bonds in England, come to a new world, and convert the, the, the wild peoples of the Americas to become Christians and spread the news. They tried to prove the Puritan, uh, prove Puritan approach in England by establishing an ideal Puritan society in, in America. In other words, the Puritans back in England were trying to form a very religious community and were persecuted, so they wanted to continue that, that, that system, form a church uh, that, they, that the whole world would be part of, and, and prove how uh, this ideal society would work in the colonies. Now, another colony that was found was that known as Maryland. Now, Charles I established Maryland in 1632 as a refuge for English Catholics. So Massachusetts was Puritans, Maryland, English Catholics. Uh, a, he granted a propriety colony to Cecilius um, Calvert, or also known as Lord Baltimore. And at, in Maryland, they also developed a t tobacco economy. Now, in 1649, the, the members in Maryland decided to pass what was known as the Toleration Act, which was religious toleration to all Trinitarian Christians, which was meant to protect the Catholic minority from the Protestant majority in the colony. Now, this act was the first formal legislation enacted, uh, albeit very limited, uh, which enacted religious freedom in American history. So even though it's not America yet, this idea of religious toleration and freedom of religion is ingrained in Maryland society and then expands further out of the colony as time goes by. Now, another group of people that arrived during this time period, we often talk about slaves as the majority of workers in the Americas. Now that comes a lot later. The earlier group of people that had arrived, and we'll talk a little bit about this, were the indentured servants. Indigenous servants made up 80% of all 17th century immigrants. They were the main source of labor in the early decades of the early colonies. They would work four to seven years in return for passage after signing a contract to the Americas. This included young and poor, and they were overwhelmingly male. If the, ser if the servants arrived before 1660 and survived, they had a decent chance of becoming a land-owning planter. So this was a way to get people to come over. If you were poor in England, they would send you over as an indentured, you would join a crew as an indentured servant, work four to seven years with the hope of getting land. Now, we often talk about a gentleman during this time period, you know, Nathaniel Bacon. Now, Nathaniel Bacon came to the, the New World as a, like a third-born son, so a, a lesser gentry, hoping to make his place in the, in the New World. The problem was back in England, only the first and maybe the second-born sons would be given inheritance. Third, fourth, fifth-born children were given very little. So this was a way for uh, the lower gentry in England to move to the New World and make something of their own. Now, in the, in 16, after 1660, there was a collapse in tobacco prices, which made, made the goal of becoming wealthy very unattainable. Former indentured servants in 16, excuse me, 1676, led by Nathaniel Bacon, pressured Governor uh, William Berkeley to confiscate land that had originally, you know, the Remember these third these these gentry had come over here and indentured servants were promised land once they finished, but now this that they ran out of land. Only a, a few rich people own land, and the other people that lived in the area were the Indians. So Nathaniel Bacon urged Governor William Berkeley to confiscate land from the Indians to provide them with the plantations that they were promised. Now Berkeley refused because he wanted to have good relations with the natives and his followers rebelled or the followers of Bacon rebelled and they burned Jamestown to the ground. Now Bacon's sudden death and arrival of royal troops led to the revolt's collapse and after the revolt planters began to replace indentured servants with African slaves. Now this is the, the shift in labor movement in the United States or in the colonies at this time. We started with indentured servitude, 
and then moved to slavery. And the other thing that Bacon's Rebellion brings out is not it was not only a fight between the different labor groups, it was also a fight between different social groups as well. We had the upper upper crest of the elite that were in control of things, and the lower the lower workers, the no peasantry in the United States, but the lower farm workers weren't being treated as they thought as equally. So they rose up and um, and fought against this. Now, although Bacon's Rebellion was a failure, the thing that it did shift was the labor movement away from indentured servants into uh, a slave-based system in the South. Now, moving back up north, so this is down in the South, the Puritans tried to emulate what they saw as the simplicity in egalitarianism they saw in early Christianity. So whereas in the South, there was more of a workers, uh, worker rebellions and farming issues in the North, Puritans ruled the day. They rejected the hierarchy and practices of the Church of England as too similar to the Catholic Church. Congressionalist Puritans did not formally renounce the Church of England, but they hoped to reform it from within. And separatist Puritans formally rejected the Church of England. Now, despite being prosecuted by the Crown in England, Puritans did not hesitate to persecute outsiders and their own people who deviated from Puritan orthodoxy. Roger Williams, for example, was banished from Massachusetts and established Rhode Island because he did not want to follow with the, 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 the patriarchal leadership. And Hutchinson, and Hutchinson also defied patri Puritan theology, especially of male authority, where only male Puritans could, uh, be in, in, uh, could control uh, the religion. So just as they were being treated intolerantly back in England, when they arrived in the New World, they continued this intolerance as well. Now, life in early England, or early New England, excuse me, was a bit different than that in the South. The New England economy was more diversified than the Chesapeake, uh, which, was, which means it wasn't dependent on a single crop or just agriculture. Puritans came from the middling sort of English society, which meant that they could finance their own passage to America. So whereas in the South, they're mostly indentured servants who came over as workers and then slaves, the Puritans could mostly finance their own passage to America, so that, and they were more affluent upon their arrival. They also moved to America as families, meaning New England had a more balanced sex ratio than the Chesapeake. Puritans lived in compact villages rather than on the land they farmed. Village life reinforced religious beliefs by making all Puritans subject to scrutiny. There was a longer life expectancy than uh, in the Chesapeake due to healthier lifestyle and climate. Uh, in the north, we have less mosquitoes and less diseases. In the south, uh, disease ran rampant. Uh, they also uh, really put an emphasis on education. And in 1647, uh, the New England colonies passed the Old Deluder Act. Uh, which was a way, uh, which was the first formal provision for public education in American history. The Puritans, however, did also believe in witchcraft, um, as we've seen, and as you see in the readings uh, about the famous Salem witch trial, um, which uh, you could go online and find a bunch of information on. So they were very uh, progressive in certain ways, but also very conservative in others. We may ask ourselves, how different are we today uh, from the Puritans? Now, the Puritans had an ambivalent uh, attitude towards Native Americans. Okay, so we've talked about how the French worked with the Native Americans to form good trade. The Spanish tried to conquer the Native Americans and put them to work. The Dutch had, uh, were pretty brutal with the, the natives. The Puritans was more ambivalent. They, con they, they coveted Indian land and believed Native Americans to be culturally inferior, excuse me, and under Satan's control. Yet, some Puritans, like John Eliot, also felt an obligation to try to convert Indians to Christianity. Now, Puritans set up praying villages, which were communities of Native American converts, and the converts adopted Puritan culture as well as Puritan religion. But notice they aren't incorporating them into their villages, they're kind of setting them apart. Now, in 1675, a group of uh, Wampanoag Indians, led by uh, Metacom, felt increasingly threatened by the English and tried to wipe them out. Now, they destroyed 20% of English villages and 5% of the population, 
before counterattacks by the English and their Indian allies prevailed. So relationships between the natives and the English were uh, very strained. And if you'd like to watch the crash course video on natives and the English, feel free to do so. Now in this lecture, we've talked about a lot of different ways that Native Americans um, and, uh, uh, and, the, and the, the, the Europeans uh, got along with one another. And we talked about the different ways colonies were set up. So a quick review of this. So the Spanish colony, very centralized, controlled by Spain and control and domination by, uh, the, na by the, uh, the natives. The French, still a lot of authoritarian control and less migration from France, good relations with the natives for trade with things like the furs. The English and the Puritans, ambivalent relationship, lots of fighting and wars between the groups, um, but an idea that you want to separate from everybody else. 